So it will be an introduction about uh, TigerDB. Uh, I'm Matthias. Uh, first, we're an American company, so I need to show this. Uh, and let's just go through the too long the entry. So it's a distributed SQL database. It looks like a MySQL primary. So there shouldn't be any changes uh, on your application. It just <laughs> looks like a MySQL uh, database. The scaling, though, is as simple as just adding more nodes. Uh, and you can even add more for storage and more for computers. So, uh, you can uh, buy it for as a database as a service from us. We have a TigerDB Cloud, and we also recently announced the uh, TigerDB Serverless, so you uh, can do pay as you go as well. But you can also run it uh, on prem or in your own cloud or any option you want. So we do have uh, both uh, uh, for uh, virtual machines and uh, bare metal as well as uh, for Kubernetes. Uh, there's an option of adding an analytics store to it. So column store, if you're running a lot of uh, uh, analytics queries for uh, scanning or aggregations, etc. We do have migrations tools for MySQL. We do have change data capture to Kafka, MySQL, and another TigerDB cluster. And it's fully open source. It's uh, Apache 2 license. So although it uh, sounds like it's a copy of MySQL, it's fully rewritten from scratch. Uh, the protocol is re-implemented in Golang. And then I can go to the introduction and the full talk. So that was the short work version. So I'm Matthias Johnson. I've been working for PinCap for a bit more than two years now. I'm working from Amsterdam. Uh, previously, I left uh, Booking.com, where I was a software developer or an engineering manager for two of the three MySQL teams. And before that, I worked as a uh, developer at uh, Oracle. Well, MySQL, Sun, Oracle, I went through all the acquisitions. And uh, there I work with the partitioning storage engine in the MySQL server. Uh, a bit about PinCap. It's a global company. It's founded in uh, 2015. Uh, it's based in the US, but uh, it has offices all over the world. Uh, Silicon Valley in Sun um, Sunnyvale. We do have an office in Amsterdam, Beijing, Shanghai, Tokyo, and uh, Singapore, among others. Uh, it's a very open uh, source culture. Uh, even from the founders, they are strong uh, open source advocates. We do have strong investors. I think we have a bit more than 500 million US dollars in funding in total. I think we're in a series D plus or something like that. And we're about 600 plus employees. The basics for TidyB, the database, it's uh, uh, to create a database platform that's open source and it's a MySQL compatible distributed data system. And by designing this from scratch, with scalability in mind, then we could create a database that's both scalable and has a high availability built in. Compared to MySQL, which was just developed for a single machine, more or less, we'll come back a bit more to the limitations of MySQL and how we can extend that. In MySQL, high availability does not come out of the box. Normally, you just have a single primary, and then, of course, you want a bit more uh, redundancy, so you add uh, some replication nodes, and uh, in the beginning, you just use the replication nodes as backups, more or less. Then you can think about uh, how to use them. But there's no built in thing for uh, failover, for switchovers, for load balancing, etc. There are also, of course, uh, replication delays here that uh, the application needs to be aware of. In TidyB, everything is created to be redundant. So the different components, it's uh, three major components. You have the placement driver, you have the TidyB node, and uh, the TidyKB node. The only thing that uh, needs to be done from the application side, and that's actually the same for MySQL, is to reconnect if the node you're connecting to is uh, gone, but that's just standard TCP more or less. Data is split into uh, parts of around 100 megabytes, so even a table, so you can see that it's uh, 
can call it uh, transparent sharding. You don't need to do any sharding or partitioning or anything like that. So it's spread across the storage, uh, making it very easy to scale out. And it's also self-balancing. And that happens by the basement driver. Uh, it does have uh, ETC embedded for keeping the cluster uh, configuration, etc. It also the timestamp oracle for uh, managing uh, the timestamp used for MCC, so multi version con concurrency control. And it takes the uh, main feature is that it takes care of the placement of the data uh, on the, the Thai KV, so the distributed key value store. And it takes in both size, it takes in load, both read and write. So it, it can do both uh, merging and splitting and moving uh, things around, all depending how your application changes. So in normal case, when you do sharding, you do shards in equal sizes. And of course, the world is not that distributed. So some shards might be really hot while some are not really used. This system actually balances all over so you can have much more utilization of the machines behind. Then we come to the TinyB server node. That's <coughs> where all of the connections are ended and uh, uh, terminated with uh, uh, the SQL parser. It's handling the protocol, of course. It also has the optimizer and executor. So it gets some metadata from the PD cluster and the actual data from the TAN KV cluster. It's also completely stateless, which means that it's super fast to scale these nodes up and down depending on the load. Uh, so that makes it very dynamic and uh, cost saving as well, because you can only use as many machines as you have uh, need right now. Uh, it's written in Golang. Uh, and as I said before, it doesn't share any code with the MySQL. It uh, re-implements the, the protocol and the, the syntax in uh, Go. This is uh, where I work mostly, uh, with uh, partitioning as well, mostly there. And then we do have the Thai KV. So Thai actually stands for titanium, and KV is the key value store. It's a uh, CNCF project graduated, so it's uh, uh, part of the Linux Foundation. Uh, it maps tables and well, databases and tables to uh, the key that's just used, and then it has the rest of the columns in the value part, and we'll come back to that a bit. And by splitting up everything uh, in the smaller groups, each such group is uh, a raft group, so that's how we can make sure that you have the uh, multiple copies of it in case one uh, node goes down, for example. And PD is also using labels, so you can check that uh, the raft group is always split uh, among uh, different availability uh, zones, or if you're running in your own data center among different uh, racks or different machines, etc. So, in case of a disaster, it should be able to continue. All in all, when you execute a query, it means that you can actually use more nodes at the same time and do things in parallel. So MySQL, I'm not sure if you're aware, but it's a single threaded system per connection, per session. Uh, and this actually makes it uh, parallel even for a single query. So for this kind of query, it would create a plan like that, that actually executes from the bottom, doing a scan, uh, starting with the ID larger than 10, applying a filter and doing partial aggregate in each of the Thai KD nodes, having uh, uh, data regions matching uh, uh, this table. And these partial aggregates is uh, sent to the Thai KD node, which is uh, doing the final aggregation and returning it to the client. And if we do an update, it's easy to see how it goes through the system. I didn't uh, put uh, the PD here because it's actually cached here normally. So if we're uh, updating uh, orders, it knows which uh, region this uh, data is set in. So 
here is actually even easier because if there's no primary key or unique key, uh, it can just do a write without reading. Uh, in some databases, you actually do need to do a read before you're writing, but uh, the system uses RocksDB in the bottom, in, in the lowest level, so we don't even need to read. So we can just send, go through the uh, TileDB node we're connecting to and send it to the leader region, which then would use the raft group for propagating the changes uh, to the other uh, uh, nodes that uh, contains this data region. Mm -hmm. And then it will uh, uh, return back that it's fully written and is consistent. Scalability in MySQL is connected slightly to the high availability, but in uh, normal cases, you do have everything in the, the primary, and then you have uh, replicas that actually are a full copy of the database. Which means that if you're scaling reads, then of course you can add more read replicas, but the application needs to be aware. So it can sh uh, send read only queries to this one and still the right ones here. Uh, so in a read, Scale out scenario, this works fairly well. Still, you do need to know about replication delay, etc., and manually handling this. When you're scaling writes, that's <coughs> a bit more tricky because you only have a single machine taking all writes. So, you need to uh, make that machine bigger, more CPU, more memory. And since the writes actually goes down the replication screen, you also do need to do that for all the other machines as well. The same with data volumes, you need to add more disk, and that goes for the whole uh, replication chain. Then the even bigger problem comes when you need even more, when a single machine can't handle all the right scale or uh, all the data size. Then you need to start to sharding on the application side, and when you do that, you're more or less saying that, yeah, we kind of don't really need to do joins, or we kind of not need to do full table scans or anything like that. We need to move logic into the application side. And then you start to think, do I need to rewrite the database in the application side, more or less? That's really tough on the developers and uh, how to operate that. But in some cases, it's easy because they're actually only using the database more or less like a key value store. So that's easy, but if you're using more of the SQL features, the algorithm gets. Yes. With TidyB, it's so much easier to scale. The answer for scaling reads is just add more nodes. Same answer for scaling writes, add more nodes. Data, add more nodes, yeah. Even more, a table doesn't fit in the single machine, yeah, add more nodes. And you can add more nodes separately in the storage layer or in the compute layers, depending on the load, you can actually adapt uh, the number of machines where you need it. So when you're adding more nodes, so let's say that we have three TIDB nodes and uh, six TIDB nodes spread over three uh, availability zones. Uh, you add a fourth uh, TIDB node. Normally you would either have the application uh, aware that it can spread uh, its connections among different uh, type B nodes, or you have a load balancer in prompts. And here we would add one type KB node in each availability so just to not have a, a bad balance in between. And then PD comes in and sees that these are unused, and it will not just add new data to it, it will actively, actively start rebalancing data and put it in here. So. Here it would put some leaders even, and some uh, followers as well. So the leader is uh, the, the full line and the other one is the best line. And it will copy the data and uh, move the leadership when uh, the copy is uh, complete as well. And I talked a bit about the type KV, which is a key value store, but Normally we talk about uh, rows and tables in uh, an SQL uh, manner, and we are actually mapping it in a very simple manner. So we're just adding a prefix on the key for the table uh, ID, and we store indexes as well in this key value store. So we append a uh, different, uh, uh, different prefix for row and for indexes. 
So for the primary key, we just add the table ID and the row ID as the key. And then we add the non-primary key columns in there. So you can also do the full primary key columns here instead, and the rest of the columns here. It depends if it's a clustered or non-clustered storage. And the clustered database means that you're actually sorting by the primary key. Non-clustered, it's heap-based, you can say. You're just adding the rows and assigning row IDs as the, the data comes in, and then you have a primary key pointing to these new row IDs. Uh, the same for unique secondary indexes. It's table ID, and you add an index ID and the index columns, then it points to the row ID. And the reason it's unique is that it can only be one set of index columns value, so that makes it unique. If we're having it as a non-unique, then we're adding the row ID to the key instead, which means that you can have a duplicate uh, index entries and still find the right uh, uh, ranges. So just to uh, clarify how it looks, a single table without an, uh, uh, the secondary key, it just adds T101, uh, row one, and then the columns, and the same for J. If we then add the key, then it adds even more rows in, uh, even more entries in the key value store. And here you see that Jane actually sorts before John, but uh, you could have uh, multiple copies of Jane with the uh, different uh, row IDs. In the end, this is stored in a RocksDB instance uh, that's uh, underneath uh, TyKB. So you can have a lot, a lot of different. Uh, uh, data ranges in uh, the RocksDB instance. Anyone working with uh, complex systems using uh, also analytics and so on can maybe recognize this image where you have some uh, OLTP or transactional relational databases here. There's usually application uh, uh, serving, web serving, maybe messaging goes as well. And then you have the uh, extract, transform, and load pipelines into a column and store or an analytics um, database where you get graphs, etc., and uh, do a lot of reporting and so on. And of course, if you're doing reporting, you probably also want to do the reverse ETL and get it back into the relational database so it can start serving data again. You probably also have different teams working with the different areas here. So it's quite complex. What if we could do it like this, having a single system that would do both the transactional load as well as the analytics load, uh, and call it HTAP instead of OLAP or OLTP. HTAP stands for Hybrid Transaction and Analytic Processing. That's something that we can actually do with the TIDB with the optional of uh, analytics store as well. So connecting to this raft group, we can also connect the Thai flash, which is a column store. So you get it stored both as a row, uh, as a row store, which is super fast. So you can use the indexes. It's easy for doing a single change, etc. Single uh, uh, row read. But you also have the column store, so if you do a, an aggregation over a single column, you don't need to read all the columns for the whole row, you just go for that column, and it's already highly compressed, and you also have some statistics already stored. Which means that it's much, much faster for analytics queries that are using fewer, fewer columns or doing aggregations, etc. And the optimizer is smart enough to be able to use this transparently, so you don't need to tell where you stored it. It's easy to even use it in a transactional context. So the transaction stamp timestamp is actually stored in the column store as well. So you actually do get a full consistent snapshot when you're doing the analytics as well. So you don't have like the daily uh, daily dumps of data or hourly dumps or anything like that. You can actually query it, uh, the analytics directly on the, the transactional data. 
So here you see that it's uh, running the key lookup for the batch ID on the row store, and then it does the table scan for the average of price on the column store. Schema changes is another thing that's actually both connected to uh, the whole ETL pipeline as well as in an ordinary transactional database. It's all online in TidyB, so you don't need to have uh, third party uh, tools like uh, Procona Toolkit online schema change or GitHub uh, online schema tool. If it's a metadata, then it will just change the metadata. If it's actually you need to copy the data, it will do that in a way to uh, and the transition in the different states, meaning that uh, transaction can just continue. There's no uh, metadata lock that would block transactions for a small time in between the, the state changes. Batteries are included as open source, so for MySQL, for example, you actually do need to go to the uh, enterprise uh, subscription for doing you know, for getting the backup or using an open source tool like uh, Procona Extra Backup. Uh, and since we're distributing the data, even if it's a large set of data, it's actually much, much faster as well since it's smaller entities. So you can stream the data directly to an external storage like S3 or another object store, for example which means that also the restore is much faster as well. Uh, we do have tools for dumping and uh, loading data. The load is uh, optimized for doing uh, uh, loading to TidyB based on it's using RocksDB. So instead of going through the whole transaction layer and uh, streaming the data through uh, TidyB nodes into TidyAV, we can actually pre-generate the SSD files for RocksDB and just ingest them directly into TypeA. So the lock less uh, resources needed for doing the imports and uh, affects the rest of the cluster a lot less as well. Uh, and it's mainly when you want to load a lot of data when you start it or migrating data from MySQL, for example, uh, which is also used for the data migration uh, uh, parts that we have. So with this, you can just connect it to MySQL and it will start doing a dump as well as uh, reading the bin log and keeping the data in sync in the, the TidyB cluster. And that's also fully highly available. Uh, you have a lot of metrics and uh, it's different uh, nodes used as well, so it's uh, automatic failover, etc. So when you connect this in the app, you will have uh, TidyB clusters that's online with the, the MySQL cluster, so you can choose when you want to move from one to another. And similar thing is with the Thai CDC, so change data capture, uh, also clustered uh, variants. So you can have the streams of the data changes to Kafka or back to MySQL system or another TIDB uh, cluster. And of course, it is not MySQL, so it's uh, different limitations than MySQL. Uh, we aim to be compatible with MySQL 8. Uh, the major things right now is uh, one collation that is missing, I would say. Uh, but most functionality is already there. The row size, <coughs> however, is limited to 120 megabytes by default. You can change that a bit, but it comes down to we want to limit the size of the transactions be fairly small because the bigger size of the transaction you have, the more effects it has on other transactions that runs concurrently. So the whole idea with TIDB is to have a massive concurrent system. Other things that are missing in the LTS, so the long-term support, is full text indexing, the spatial data types of functions, trigger store procedure events, and XML functions. We just added uh, the feature for uh, foreign keys, for example, so we're working on uh, things. I'm not sure if we ever would implement XML functions, for example. It depends on if we have a highly paying customer or something like that. <laughs> so to wrap it up, uh, TidyDB allows easy scaling. 
it's less work needed from the developer. They can think more about the application instead of adapting to the database. So there's no dealing with the read-write splits. There's no dealing with the replication delay or sharding when you come to the happy problem of scaling. We do have a demo site if you want to play a bit with the TidyB. Uh, currently, we're streaming all the changes from uh, GitHub. It has uh, six billion rows, I think, in a single table. Um, you can compare different uh, GitHub repositories and so on, or even check out your own GitHub ID if you want some stat statistics. Uh, you can get some uh, of the explain uh, 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 data as well, so uh, how it actually resolves it if it uses the type KV, the row store or the column store, for example. And it also has uh, uh, the gimmick feature of uh, chat to query, so you can just use a natural language as well, and it will convert it to an SQL um, command and then execute that. So it, it's quite fun, actually. A bit, I think this is slightly dated, but here's one actual uh, TidyB cluster in production. It has uh, 168 type KV nodes and 21 type DB nodes and uh, it has more than half a petabyte of data, etc. And that's what I had to say. And I'm happy to answer any questions and I will be mingling here as well. So, yeah? Uh, the updates, you had uh, three replicas updated. Yeah. Uh, could you outline when you when do you uh, acknowledge to the application that the when the majority is uh, uh, accepting the changes. When, so when after it, the first write, you acknowledge? No, the majority, it needs to have both a leader and one follower if you have a three copies. Okay. So two? Two, in, in, two in, because it, you, it's all configurable. You can have five replicas or, or a single one as well, but default is three. That's a, a good default, I think. So for three replicas, it needs mm -hmm. two, yes. Yeah. Thank you. It's based on Ruff, so if you know how Ruff works, that's pretty much what we do. No, I was just concerned if you scale out, you have more nodes, you have more replicas, that the delays would uh, increase. But you answered that, thank you. Okay. Another question, yes. completely different dimension. How do you make money? <laughs> so we do have uh, it uh, database as a service, but we also sell uh, uh, sell support. And yeah, we do some smaller uh, consultant uh, work and so on and so on, but uh, those are the main uh, things. Yeah? Given that you implement TIPV so heavily, would, would it ever make sense for PingCap to donate TIPV to to the CNCF? I say this, I used to work with the CNCF, okay. so now I'm disinterested. <laughs> I actually don't know. Okay, okay. How, how long have you been, has TIDB existed? Uh, it's founded in uh, 2015. I think okay. the first version was released in 2016. Okay. I think the very first one was using HBase for storage, actually. Mm -hmm. And then they uh, rewrote, uh, well, created the TIDB. Relatively long in cloud native terms. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and cool. It, it's interesting you say cloud native because that's one thing that has been. Uh, the goal whenever we create something and develop and it needs to run cloud native and that by cloud native it should be able to run in Kubernetes or on VMs or it should really matter and, and it all yeah. should also be able to be quite small units mm -hmm. so it's not just the really big machine that we need to scale out. Well I mean that one slide that you had where you were like the solution is just add more nodes if you need to do this add yeah. more nodes kind of Underlines that that was like a key concern from the beginning. Yeah. Cool talk. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a question related to the uh, slide where you showed that uh, during my query, you can still get the data from both the T store and also from the store. I wonder um, how, how do you decide which store to actually query under some heuristics? Yeah, so it's a cost based op uh, optimizer. Okay. So it uh, Checks the different, the whole um, area of uh, what is a greedy optimization. So it sees uh, which path of the plan 
it can reduce, and it also compares the cost if it should uh, continue doing that. So, including like uh, join ordering, etc., as well as well as if it's uh, fast, more cost efficient to retrieve the data from the column store or the row store. Other limitations on queries, or can technically any query uh, access both Yeah. Yeah, it's just what's efficient. You can even give a hint to the optimizer in the query to say which of the stores you want to use. Yeah. Um, my question is in the context of um, loading the, the data from the transactional side to the analytical side when you are having updates and write queries. Yeah. So do you do that load as part of the transaction as well? Like, uh, as part of before the end transaction, we also transaction to be uh, isolated or we do it eventually asynchronously after the return back. So it's slightly asynchronous, but mm -hmm. the optimizer actually waits. So mm -hmm. in the row, uh, there's the time step, so the transaction time step is in, uh, embedded in the row as well. So the optimizer can see if uh, the data is processed on the analytics side, the column store as well. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some configuration so you can uh, determine how much it would wait for okay. it to make sense uh, as well. But that also means that when you're scanning the data in the column store, yeah. it will only use the one that actually should be seen from this transaction. The so, database is in words. Yeah. And that's a lot of the analytics are actually yeah. just <coughs> whatever you dump into the system, it will be there. If you have a concurrent transactions, you don't actually have that concept in a lot of other systems. And would you say that uh, this loading is quite uh, over FP or do you like in a, in a situation where you are really right, the number of true number of queries coming to write the transaction side is quite high. How fast do you see this learning is happening? Is it a blockage or not? I actually don't know. Do you have any data on that, Daniel? Daniel is our support yeah. engineer. So I also don't really have any uh, real data on that. Mm -hmm. But also the, the thing with uh, like Flash is that you don't need to have all your tables in the columnar store. So you can okay. just say like, um, I have like 10 tables and I want the, these three tables in the column store because there it makes sense. Yeah. And then you can still do the queries that combine data from both, even if not all the data is in the column uh, store. So that way you reduce the overhead. Yes. Yeah. Because the transformation is not okay. And as well as you can just add more time flash nodes for actually spreading the load as well. So you can scale it a bit that way. It is really right time before the analytics. Yeah. Yes. So we do have uh, Daniel Van Aden here. He's uh, working as a support engineer. We do have uh, Ron here is, uh, in sales, and we have uh, Eve here from uh, the product manager, and we have Kahn here as well. So if you have any questions, feel free to mingle with us later on as well. Thanks so much. Cool. Uh, so words. <laughs> I'm talking about partitioning in Apache Kafka. And my first question to you would be, who of you actually work with Apache Kafka? Could you raise your hand? Give you have one, two, one, two, three. Okay, we do have some hands. Who of you kind of didn't work with Apache Kafka, but you know what it is overall? It's good. And who of you thought that you were coming for a talk about Franz Kafka? <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I, I'll try to keep it more simple because I just have a lot of also people who didn't have like deep experience with Apache Kafka. So today we are going to talk about partitioning in Apache Kafka and how to do it right. Um, and actually, yeah, about Apache Kafka. So you do it to uh, transport the messages across your multiple systems. It can be microservices, can be IoT devices, can be anything like a T-pod there, like sending the messages about the temperature of the water to my phone. Um, and uh, when it comes to partitioning, what is partitioning? So in Apache Kafka, we often talk about topics. And the data to a topic is on one side pushed by some producers, and on the other side is pulled and read by some consumers. But the thing is, the topic itself, kind of this middle storage, is an abstract concept because physically on the disks we keep the data in partitions in multiple 
partitions. Um, and this is kind of the basic how Apache Kafka works. And partitioning is a mechanism to distribute the data from the topic across multiple servers on the cluster. It is a way which allows us to send the data from the producers in parallel and then to read the data by the consumers in parallel. So it's a key to horizontal scaling of the system which relies on Apache Kafka. That's why it's quite important that when you will be working with Apache Kafka or you're working with it, one of the key uh, decisions you will have to make is how exactly you're going to distribute your data from the topic at, uh, among the multiple partitions. So, yeah, this is kind of, those of you who came for the Franz Kafka talk, this is what Apache Kafka. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, then uh, when you create a topic, Apache Kafka topic, the first thing you will have actually, or like among the things you have to configure, is actually how many of those partitions you want to have. You have to link all the questions on making the decision, so you will have to decide uh, and configure it at the start. And also, in some cases, it will be quite difficult to change that number of partitions later. So you need to really think about your data, your um, kind of uh, use case, and decide how many of those you need. Uh, let's look at two extremes. If you have too few of those partitions, uh, or you have too many. If you have too few of the partitions, this will negatively affect on the performance and scalability. Because technically it's like having uh, two traffic lanes uh, instead of five. If you have a lot of cars like here in Berlin, you know, like if you have five of traffic lanes, so everything will be moving way faster than the big hours. Um, also very importantly is that the number of consumers, so those which applications which read the data, the number of consumers in a consumer group, so however you want to do it like in parallel, that number is limited by the number of partitions you have in the system. Uh, so you can of course add more consumers, but those consumers will be idle because the maximum the relationship between consumer and the partition will be one to one. So one consumer will be taken uh, about one partition. And because of this uh, consideration, there is an advice when you create a topic, put the number of consumers uh, higher, projecting the growth of the system into the future. Uh, and it's a right suggestion, a uh, recommendation. However, it gives us temptation to add significantly more um, uh, partitions just in case. Uh, and this might lead to other problems. All the admin operations, such as backup and upgrades, they will be taking more time as you are getting more and more uh, partitions. Uh, also, with uh, more partitions, you get more um, consumer balancing. Also, like uh, with the partitions, it's like you not only add the partition, you also add the replicas for it. So the entities you have to take care of, of it is not like it's just one partition, but plus usually two uh, in sync replicas per partition, so three entities. So uh, that's why you need to remember that um, having uh, too many partitions doesn't really come for free, but having too few is also bad, right? So where is this golden middle and more importantly, how can we calculate it? Uh, and my advice for this would be to start with the end in mind. So when you are designing your system and you are thinking how many partitions you actually need, think how the data will be consumed uh, by your consuming applications and what is the throughput of your consumers. Uh, for example, if your targeted read capacity is one gigabyte per second, but your single application can read only, consumer application can read only 100 megabytes per second, uh, then logically you will need to have uh, 10 consumers and that would require 10 partitions. At least this gives you the minimal number of partitions you want to have in the system. Uh, obviously, you will have to set it somewhat higher, thinking about the future of the system and other uh, things. However, 
I wanted to describe it in extremes. Um, yeah, so you made the very tough decision, you decided on the number of partitions. Another question, can you change that number later? And the answer is, like with everything in life, uh, yes and no, the best. Um, so you cannot go lower, you cannot say, okay, I had like 10 partitions, actually I needed 5, how about I remove those extra 5? No, you, can, you can't do that. However, you can add more. Whether adding more is an easy step or not, depends how exactly you distribute the data. And in particular, if you care about the ordering of the records and you use the keys for distributing the data. If you use the keys and you care about the ordering, that will add you quite a headache. We'll see later how you can do it still, but yeah. Um, but for now, let's move and talk about the default practitioner and how exactly it actually works in Apache Kafka. So something you use by default there. Um, <coughs> So the default partitioner has three main ways to figure out where exactly to send the data, when to produce the data, where exactly in which partition it should go. The first uh, criteria, like the first way, is if you decided to explicitly specify that you want the record to go into partition one, two, or any, any like you can explicitly specify the number of partition. Normally. You don't want to do that. That's kind of a micromanagement. However, it's really nice for some edge cases and some interesting scenarios where you need to overcome some issues. And actually, that one we also will see later. Um, if you didn't specify explicitly the information, then a partitioner moves, moves on and looks if you actually have the key. So together with the record, you usually send the key, or like you can send it, you don't have to. Uh, you can send the key, and uh, if you send the key, uh, then partitioner will take the hash of the key, do a model on the total number of partitions which are present in your topic, and then use that number to correlate uh, the partition to the, sorry, the key to the partition. So, and the idea is, for every key, you will always know which exact partition it will go. So it will be like the correlation where you can rely. If you get, get the same key, it will just be in the same partition. And why it is important? Because this is how we are making sure that the ordering of the records, how you write the data to the classroom, how you read it, the ordering will be the same. Um, and it's because partition itself on the disk is just a log file, so you always append to the end of the log file. So you always can predict which record came first, which record came second, and so on. So the keys usually needed for the ordering. Um, but here's the problem. If you change the total number of partitions, coming back to like increasing the number of partitions, because like, I don't know, maybe you have seven now, like, okay, I want to add three more. And you go from seven to 10, but then the correlation between the key and partition will be different. So your key apples <coughs> now will go into partition seven, whereas before it was going to partition three. And this will ruin all the delicate mechanism and all your ordering which you are relying on to. So there is an extra step which you will need to make, which you will see all again later, but this is why you don't want just to increase the number of partitions. Great. So um, if you don't use the keys, then the partitioner will rely on the mechanism to distribute the data in the most efficient and effective way uh, which exists for Apache Kafka. Um, and this in all days was happening with a round robin partitioner. And round robin partitioner would spread the records one by one across partitions uh, to achieve this even distribution of data. However, it's important to understand that the round robin partitioner will not really like send the records like, okay, first record came, goes to the first partition, second to the second partition. If it will be doing like that, it will be so inefficient. I mean, like for the network uh, load, for the load of the broker, like sending those granular items, it's really bad. 
So uh, it will uh, put it into bulks and then send those batches to the cluster when it accumulates. And this results in nice and even distribution of data. However, it has one issue. It's not truly optimal the way how this batching is done. So uh, that's why from the version 2.4, uh, we are relying on a different default partition, sticky partition. And what sticky partition will do, it will select only one partition, then start accumulating those records locally till one of two conditions happens. Either we reach the maximum size of the batch, or we reach the maximum time which we allocated for accumulating the data. And then when we reach that condition, we are sending the data to the cluster. And then partition will select the next partition and the next and so on. And the idea is that over time, the balance of the data is still preserved. Uh, so you don't, even though you do it a bit differently, like per one partition, but over time when we are thinking, we still have a nice even distribution of data on the cluster. And the one advantage is this approach, which takes a sticky partitioner, achieves actually reduction in latency by 50%, according to the benchmarks they put together as they implemented this feature. And the CPU utilization also reduced by 5-15%. So this is pretty nice because with Apache Kafka, we do care about performance and how fast everything is. Um, so yeah, so this is about sticky partition. Uh, like, yeah, but like with everything else in life, when you have something nice, you still have to keep in mind some edge cases and we will come back what can go wrong with sticky partitioner because uh, there are some issues you need to be aware of. Uh, but for now, um, those are two settings you can modify for sticky partition. The first one, the linger mess, this is a time bound. So how long we are waiting before sending the data and the batch size. This is like the size bound, so how big the maximum size of the uh, batch which we want to send. Cool, so default partitioner. We look, exact partition number, hash of the key, sticky partitioner. Um, if you don't like either of those options, honestly, you are picky. Uh, but that's fine, because you can create your own custom partitioner and implement your own custom logic. And uh, this is pretty handy, even though it's not really very frequently used from, from what I can see, but it's still pretty handy if you need to use uh, some kind of uh, decide on the key, key like combination of your properties or some other conditions where exactly you want to send the data. I don't know, maybe on Monday you send it to partition one. Like, you, you can do a lot of stuff with custom partitioner. Great, so that, those were the options which we have, um, but we need some motivation to implement a good partitioning strategy. And nothing gives a good motivation than seeing when things are going really wrong. Um, so, um, and the biggest issue we can run with uh, partitions is unbalanced uh, partitions uh, where uh, it looks like this. For example, let's imagine we have a topic. Uh, data distribution didn't go that evenly for some reason. And you might think it's probably like a rare thing, but sadly no. And even we often talk to our uh, customers and they come to us uh, with some questions and also like how to get of the situations. The reasons for this kind of uh, scenarios are wild, but let's look <laughs> how exactly they are um, affecting the system. And who actually is the biggest victim of unbalanced partitions? Starting with producers. So producers actually, it's kind of funny because producers dictate where we put the data. But uh, problems with unbalanced partitioning is not really super visible on the producer side. Just look at the data, even though there are certain cases. For example, if you're producing the data and your producer has to send data to the same partition again, again, and then they may be waiting for acknowledgement and producer has to keep more data locally before sending because uh, it waits for acknowledgement from the server. Uh, then what happens? We have issues with the storage, we have issues with performance. But generally speaking, producers are the least victim of the situation. 
especially if you compare to all the troubles brokers and consumers are falling into. And to understand what is happening on the brokers, uh, let's uh, think how the data actually written there. On the disks of the brokers, you have folders, and each folder corresponds to a partition. And within that folder, we have segments, like file segments. Those are log files, um, the segments of the partition. Uh, and they contain records. So when we send the data, when the producer gives the data, sends the data into the cluster, that's written there. So when we have a hot partition, so partition with a huge amount of data, um, that means a heavy load on the disk of the broker, on the file system of the broker. Um, and our brokers, naturally, they are quite resistant. However, if you have not only one code partition, but you get more and more, the broker becomes slower, performing all the operations slower, worsening all the metrics you have. Um, and uh, sadly enough, uh, it will be not affecting only those code partitions which you have, but also the rest of the partitions and replicas which we just don't like it to be stored on that broker. Um, so you can kind of rebalance and make sure, like rebalance partitions across the brokers and make sure that no single broker has too many of those hot partitions. Um, however, again, if the logic of data distribution is not correct, this is just a temporary solution. Great, let's move to consumers. If you're thinking like, the uh, broker suffering, uh, wait for consumers. So each consumer, is exclusively assigned to one or more uh, partitions. So a consumer can take care of several partitions, but if we scale it to the maximum so that we give all the energy of that consuming application only to one partition, then it will be like one-to-one -one, like in this picture. Um, and if we have a hot partition, then uh, the corresponding responsible consumer will have to use more resources to process all that amount of data. Um, and uh, since we cannot really add more nodes to process the data from, from partitions, we can't really have two consumers processing data from the partition. Um, there are ordering issues, like you, you just can't do that. Um, that's why at that point of time, your only solution will be to do vertical scaling for the node of the uh, consumer. And there is nothing bad about vertical scaling, totally valid solution. However, it has its limitations and it's not infinite. And also, uh, if you are relying on the automated orchestration tools such as Kubernetes uh, for your setup, then most probably you are using the same type of the instances for all the nodes, for all your consumers. And that would mean if you have um, to use vertical scaling, you will be using significantly larger nodes just for the sake of that hot partition, even though the rest of the partitions or the rest of the consumers will be underutilizing the power. And in the world where we do care about uh, saving the energy costs and uh, saving the money and kind of being nicer to the nature, this is not really good. And even if uh, you manage to make it that the consumer can process a lot of that uh, huge partition, uh, you will still have an increased lag. So it's like a metric we use to evaluate performance of the system. Um, however, the worst comes when actually consumer fails, it struggles to process the data. And what happens, it tries to consume either too much memory or too much CPU. And it's like killed without a memory exception. And then a new node starts happy and eager to jump on that workload. Uh, but then the new one is also killed because it tries to consume too much data. And it goes on and on and it just becomes a disaster. Um, but why all of this happened? And how can we prevent the issue of unbalanced partitions? Uh, there are multiple different reasons. Uh, first one is a bad selection of the keys uh, for your data. 
Imagine we are running an online shop and we are selling cheese. And uh, the purchase flow relies on a much of the topic and to distribute the data across the partitions and also to make sure that the ordering of the records uh, is actually correct, we decided to use customer ID as a key. And it all kind of started well, but soon we realized that not all of our customers are equal when it comes to their love to the cheese. Some of them make purchases like once or twice a month a week, but others are, are really into cheese uh, and they will do multiple purchases several times a day. And you love those customers. However, uh, your system doesn't because they contribute to creation of hot uh, uh, partitions. And the solution would be to find the key which uh, has the highest cardinality, this kind of like variation of values you can have, but still will help you with the critical ordering. For example, for this case, maybe the shopping uh, trip ID, some kind of a shopping trip where you know that the number of events is limited, uh, but uh, the ordering of those events is crucial for us, would be better than the uh, consumer, um, customer ID as a key. So uh, it's difficult to predict what key will be the best because you never know the future, um, but uh, it's worth thinking and trying to get the, uh, the best one. Cool, maybe you don't really use the keys and you're still like, okay, I rely on the default partitioning mechanism, what can go wrong? Uh, and then you check the metrics of your cluster and like, oh, so something happens there. So there are several reasons for that. And one of those is that your system might not be ready to uneven data distribution over time. Let's look at the graph uh, or kind of like a very imaginary timeline of the activity of our users over the day. And uh, for retail, usually it's pretty frequent to see that uh, most of the customers will be more active during the day hours. I mean, we are in Berlin, maybe there are some shops uh, which kind of does the opposite, but uh, let's say it's like daytime stuff. And if we are using the sticky partitioner, we have those two properties, linear mass and batch size. If we keep them as default, then you're not even accumulating the batches. You're sending them immediately because the linear mass time bound is set to zero. So um, that again results in heavy load on the uh, network traffic and on the brokers. So we want to do two things. First of all, we want to increase the size of the batch so that we send a bit bigger amount of data. And second of all, we want to increase the linger mass so that the time we allow for collecting of the records is a bit longer. However, you don't really want to increase linger mass too much because otherwise, during the night when you don't have enough users to make those operations, you just have to wait till you finally fill in the twice and wait for the time. So you need to keep it short enough. And this kind of uh, fits majority of the cases. However, there is one tiny, tiny issue which can result in really huge partition. Uh, and the problem is, some people with a very innocent goal of finding values which can kind of be just perfect for all scenarios. They will say the link of us very, very, very small, but the bench size is like crazily big, I mean like hundreds of megabytes or something. And this kind of should work, but this has a very negative effect when you have unexpected data leaks. So, for example, if your producer has to restart and then it sends every accumulated data into the cluster and then everything gets into a single partition because you allow that by the size, size, uh, by the size of the batch. So, be careful of using any extreme values. It's not possible, I mean, unless you can predict all the uh, uh, corner cases. Um, one more problem with sticky partitioning, which I want to mention, uh, which was fixed. However, uh, you need to be aware of extra properties you want to set for your partitioner. And it's called a sticky partitioner problem, uh, kind of an avalanche. Uh, and it happens when one of the brokers is significantly slower 
than others. Maybe it has issues with those hot partitions, or just like having, I don't know, some, some issues with the broker. So it's slow. Um, and how sticky partitioner will work? We accumulate the data, we send the data, so we go those rounds, and then we also wait for some message from the broker saying that I am okay, you can send me more data. But remember, our first broker is slow. So we started accumulating data and we wait for the broker to say that we can send the data. Um, and the broker is silent. We accumulate and we accumulate data. And by the time we get the confirmation from the broker that we can send the data, we accumulated way significantly more records than we planned initially. So that broker, the poor broker, which is struggling for its poor life, gets significantly more records than uh, is actually was planned. So this is bad because it can actually quickly get, because it will become more slow and it will get more and more records. So it, it's pretty nasty. Because of this, uh, in Apache Kafka 303, we have now two properties which help to overcome this issue. First one is that uh, you can use the adaptive partitioning. And this helps the partitioner to adjust the amount of data it sends based on how slow the broker is. And second one is the availability timeout. It's just like, okay, if the broker doesn't reply to me within, I don't know, 10 milliseconds, uh, I drop it, uh, like, so I move to the next uh, partition. So those two properties can really help overcome that issue. If you are using anything before version 3.3, then my question would be, why so? Um, but if you have good reasons, then you will have to play with linger mask, but be sure not to increase the latency significantly. And uh, you probably will have to rebalance the partitions across uh, the cluster on a regular basis uh, to make sure that no single broker has to be too slow because of hot partitions or other reasons. Uh, great. Uh, the reason uh, you had initially too few partitions, you added more, but it didn't really fix the issue completely, and you kind of had a bit of disbalance of the size of the partitions. Um, but what if <laughs> it's kind of too late for that advice? I mean, like, advice is good, but if you are ready in that situation, um, and maybe the number of partitions was really, really low, or I don't know, some key were bad, but brokers are struggling, uh, consumers are desperate, everything's on fire, and your management is really, really bad. Okay, so you have a really bad day. Um, so, what options actually you do have? Um, first of all, if you're not using keys, and I know I said in the previous month that it doesn't really fix completely, but you can still add more partitions if you're not using keys. Um, might be not the best, like it was, might not really like be a fixing the issue, even though if you have reasonable data retention period, over time it will balance out, and at least it will give you a possibility to add more consumers, so that at least you have the breathing space in the consumer applications. Um, if you use the keys, Technically speaking, you can still add more partitions uh, so that it also kind of balances out and again you add more consumers. However, here it's not that easy because again, because of the way how we have this relation between the key and the partition, um, we need to make sure when you add extra partition for that hot key and you want to do the move the data somewhere, that you're not ruining the rest of the keys so that they go exactly to the same partitions where they belong, so that ordering of the records maintains. Uh, for this, you will use custom producer. You might also want to use custom assigner. But this custom producer it will look like this. So this is like a kind of a Java code for the producer. So when you encounter the key, the hot key, let's say bananas, you do the uh, specified explicitly where the data should go to which partition. Um, if you are doing having the rest of the keys, which are normal, not hot, you want to put them where they belong in the partitions which already exist. But here you need to make sure that you are accounting for any extra uh, partitions which you added. So you just do something for 
um, you can imagine. If you have a lot of different magic there, like different hot partitions, and kind of you just add more and more extra custom logic, that will become really spaghetti code. So, um, to some extent, that can help, but there can be time when those workarounds are no longer sufficient, and when you want really to look at all the bad stuff which happened and use all the learnings and kind of take a deeper approach, um, apply all those learnings, redesign the partitioning strategy, and migrate the topic. And that might be the most dramatic, and I see some faces which are very sad right now, uh, but that can be, might be the most dramatic uh, approach uh, for solving this problem. However, that's the only proper way to solve the problem, not only actually of uh, rebalancing of records across the partitions, uh, but also it is very helpful for other cases, for example, scaling down. You can't really scale down otherwise, you will have to recreate the topic. Um, also for disaster recovery, also if you change dramatically the schema of the data, you most probably will have to have a new topic. Um, so it's a pretty useful skill and sometimes just something which is unavoidable and you will have to do it anyway. Great. Um, key learnings. Uh, when you are thinking about the number of partitions you need, think about how the data is consumed by your, by your consumer applications, uh, with the keys, look for the key with the highest cardinality, so the variation of the keys you can have in the system, and the most critical ordering. Um, keep in mind data distribution over time, of course observe and monitor, and finally be ready for the change. Um, in this link, you will find some resources, but also if you are planning to migrate from one topic to another, there is a very useful material. Uh, me and our uh, staff software engineer, Olena Bobenko, we did a talk talking about all the things you will run into when you try to migrate from one Apache Kotlin topic to another one and change the schema of the rest. So it was at um, a Kafka Summit, so you can, you can watch it. And finally, check iEvent.io. Um, yeah, so we have a platform with uh, Apache Kafka as well as other uh, 10, so top in total is 11 different open source data tools and all the integrations, everything you need uh, to create your products. And check it out and let us know how it goes. With this, thank you so much for listening to me and I'm all ears to your questions about Franz Kafka. So what do you think the cockroach symbolized for Franz Kafka? Oh, <laughs> <that's not that. laughs> okay, I just don't stop. remember I read anything from I need to read now about Franz Kafka. Uh, okay, so I do actually have a real question, which is uh, you mentioned that you went out and talked to some customers and saw their unbalanced partitions without revealing customer details because you know we can't do that. Like what? What was the most interesting scenario that you heard from the customer? So I think actually uh, I, uh, the one where we have this data peak, when you kind of like that was from the customer, okay. uh, and that was kind of interesting because technically like you don't do anything wrong and this kind of like recommendation. Uh, so that was pretty interesting. Also, the fact that many, uh, what I also uh, feel that a lot of customers or like a lot of people who are using Apache Kafka, they tell like, yeah, like set partition number higher. But then we have this from another customer like, oh, but we have some problems. Everything is kind of slow. It's like, oh, how many partitions you have? And I like this and this and like, but what is the law? And I'm like, mm, actually, you don't need that amount of partition. You can cut, cut it like by, by a third and uh, like not by third, like to leave one third of that and it still will be uh, good enough. So you don't really need that amount of partitions. Um, so yeah, those I think kind of good things. Uh, I do have a question. I think at the beginning of the presentation, you mentioned that each partition um, will be sending data on each other, like um, has a one-to-one -one correlation with consumers. So each consumer will be reading data from the same partition. What if you have consumer groups? Can the consumer within one consumer group consume data from one partition or is it still one to one? 
So actually, like within the consumer group, this is actually important because like within the consumer group, it's like one to one. If within the consumer group, you have eleven consumers, but you have only ten partitions, it means that ten consumers will be busy doing work, and one will be like the standby or like uh, idle. However, like sometimes they say, like you need to have some idle also consumers because like if someone goes down, then that one can pick up the work. Uh, but there is one to one, and I think the reason for that, the biggest one, is that if you have more than one consumer, how do you go into guarantee against the ordering of the records? I think there are more reasons for that, but this is kind of like you can't really have within the consumer group more consumers than you have partition. But you can have several different consumer groups. Uh, I mean, like for different. Uh, Different scenarios for different types of applications, right? So this is like. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm just wondering if you enable this adaptive number of partitions on, does it mean Kafka will monitor uh, and change the environments and the bytes and the maximum uh, minimum bytes for that automatically? So you said those separately, right? So. Um, uh, I'm not sure what are the consequences of, of kind of enabling it, uh, but it should try to, if it's a slower broker, mm -hmm. it will try to send there less okay. data. Okay. I think it's better to use it in combination with a timeout yeah. so that you don't really run, so you kind of still uh, use a timeout, okay, like if you're not re replying, then it's still like, uh, but overall, yeah, so that's all. Any more questions? I do have another question. <laughs> uh, and you mentioned that the more drastic change is to create a new topic and migrate the data there. So will you need to process data that is within your attention period? Or is there some sort of like time stamp where you say, this is up until when the consumers have read, so you only need to start from there? Or do you also need to reprocess and re read data from before? This actually like two, like there are different options you have, but those are two separate options. So technically you uh, don't have to reprocess the data. Okay. So depending on, on your particular scenario, you can actually totally like switch Say because when then you recreate the topic. So the difficulty is that you also need to switch the producers and the consumers. And this moment where you're switching it, how to prevent duplicated readings and how to find this moment. You can of course shut everything down and then you kind of it's easy, you just switch. I mean it's not easy, but it's kind of like you you kind of can think, okay, I will stop the system, I will switch everything. So because like it's difficult in the moving river of the data to do the switch, right? But not many systems can afford stopping their flow of data. And also, like if you stop that, like going back will be difficult if you want to revert. Uh, or it's also testing is difficult. So usually you want actually to do it while the data is flowing. And then it means that you need to keep some data. You will be actually reprocessing some of the data to find this kind of like middle like you you actually try to to create two processing at the same time and then when stuff is going you just switch the producer and consumer it's it's uh, well, let's say it's, it's not <laughs> super easy and there are different things you need to keep in mind for doing it properly but there are different options i think it all depends really like how valuable the data like uh, I know that many actually also use the data. Like they can, like yeah, I can switch. I can reprocess the data from some source, and they don't really need to care about that. That's easy. Uh, but if it's data which is for production, then you need to have a smarter solution. How to do it like on the live system uh, when you're switching? Mm -hmm. Any more hands? Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm ready to talk about France. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I have a basic question. So if you have unbalanced partitions, uh, what would be the consequence of like having say a weekly job running that you know rebalances the particular data, like it is going to take up those partitions? Would there be any consequences of that? You mean to kind of that you have the data and you start moving the data from one partition? Yeah, move it between partitions and rebalance it over. You can't do that. I mean. Okay. I mean, like, I don't know like, how crazy it can go, but you, you don't want to do that. 
and I think you can't really do that because so the data in Apache Kafka is immutable. Uh, you can't really go and change it. And also uh, like the whole concept of Apache Kafka. So you have the log files in a way that you always write to the end of the log. And it's really useful because it's very fast. Now imagine you're like, okay, let me just kind of go and try to rebalance the data within those log files. I don't know if it's even possible. Uh, and in any case, you shouldn't really. So that's, that's why actually like you can't really change. It's like, it's immutable. Okay, even the files themselves cannot be changed. Like if you don't touch the files, the files themselves to like uh, balance out the, you know, the, the sort of matrix for the first partitions. No, if, if I understand you correctly, no, you, you don't want to do that. Uh, okay. And you can't. Uh, you always append to the end. So uh, you can just kind of drop the file, create a new one, but you don't want to change kind of in the middle existing file. Also, it will be super, super slow. Okay. Like imagine you have to go like the file is, is kind of like if you go somewhere in the middle, you start like, it's just the complexity, which I'm saying that this kind of recreation of the topic is complex. What you're suggesting is probably even more, like, significantly more complex to do and keeps the performance well. Yes. So uh, let's say uh, I have a partition and, uh, and it's, a, it's a web partition, it's a lot of data. And I want, uh, the general consumer group, I want two consumer to listen to the partition and process it. But uh, ordering is not uh, required. So can I do it? No, you cannot. You cannot do it. Uh, you cannot have two consumers reading data from one partition. You can only have one consumer. It's like opposite. One consumer can read from two partitions, but uh, you can't have any extra consumer is idle. They're consumer, but if you don't do ordering, you consumer groups and groups. Ah, yeah, that's a good point. That, that's a good point. No, but if I'm doing two consumer group, then uh, still a consumer has to process all the data. Yeah, yeah. Yes, but you can skip. You can like if you need to optimize performance, you just can say that the consumer groups. So, so even. I would say more. I but never so. tried this. I mean, but I'm, I'm actually right now tempted like to try. Like yeah, yeah. because you have to kind of then jump. Yeah. Uh, exactly. So I would say like the same logic can do it in the same consumer group instead of doing it in your consumer group, right? You know. you, you, it's, it's like just uh, so let's say Apache Calc is actually pretty simple when it comes to the interfaces and what you can do and what you cannot. Um, and I would say this is kind of a bit like misusing the whole concept. But I don't know. Maybe you will uh, add some extra stuff to Apache no, Calc. It's a trade-off, right? Like if I have a partition which is has a lot of data and I don't care about ordering, I might process it. Uh, that is say, like mm. in groups instead of doing it sequentially. Yeah, no, I don't think it's useful. that you pick it and it's gone. It's like you need to like observe, to observe, then there is another thing you need to like log and the process the other ones. Like, these people, like, at some point, there is a check that we process the data or not, so that we still eventually cannot get the problem. Yeah, let's well, say Apache Kafka is not designed to do that. Okay. One question about uh, what about immutability and compacted topics? Mm -hmm. How how it works? I don't get it. You compact it per key, right? Yeah. So uh, if you have keys, so technically, if you compact the topics, then actually uh, that is beneficial because if you have like hot keys which comes to the same, so eventually the data will be compacted. So I assume it's still kind of still bad because you need to to still process like the producer will have to send the same like all the time to the same partition also like the compaction doesn't have i'm not sure how how soon compaction happens so i said but i think it actually like it's actually yes for the if you have the keys you can use compaction and it will help you um how you solve issues when you have three partitions with compacted keys and then you extend it to five partitions with compacted keys only uh, I think it will be the same. No, no because it, like the problem is that compacted keys will stay in a, in a partition and new keys will appear in, in another partition. So you will have two partitions yeah. with the same key 
and it's compacted and you cannot guarantee ordering and like everything is that, That's actually, yeah, so for those, like if you add uh, the custom partitioner and then uh, you're like, okay, I will have this my code data and it will go somewhere else, but yeah, you, for that one you will have an issue because it's actually stored uh, in the one of the partitions and then you will be sending it to a new mm -hmm. partition. So there is something, yes, something else to consider. This is actually doesn't really, like, whether you do compaction or not, I think that's the issue same. Yeah, this would mention that you would go away eventually, but this compacted yes. them. Yeah, be, exactly. So it, the, I think... It's probably forever or almost forever. Yeah. So I, I, for me, it's kind of still so, so the same, but but I, I got yeah, you're right. Like you need to really take care. Like it's 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 even more difficult to add extra partitions if you have the keys. Amazing! Thank you so much. Uh, I'll be still here. So if you have more questions, then just come to me. Thank you.